Good evening all, and welcome. I hope you're ready, as tonight we are again venturing into the depths of the wilderness. But this time we're going to stay a while. So pitch your tent and get comfortable, because it's time to let the darkness take control. This all went down during the spring break of my junior year of high school. My school was in a pretty small Iowa town, with a district spanning several smaller hamlets. During the summer of 2014, a few friends of mine put together a film club that would make short films and compete in national film festivals against other schools. We were a pretty small group and found it kind of difficult to get together for any actual filming until spring break of 2015, when we made plans for a little excursion. Four of us ended up going on the trip, myself and three members of the club, Jake, Bill and Kyle. We ended up choosing to go camping out at Mossy Glen Hollow a supposedly haunted state park up in northeastern Iowa. Since the 1850s, there have been several murders and suicides out at Mossy Glen, including a few decapitations and a hired hitman in the 1930s. Being the edgy teens that we were, we jumped at the chance to go hiking and camping somewhere like that. It was within 15 minutes of a small town so stocking up on food wouldn't be that big of an issue either. So, all lights green. We load up two of our sedans, programmed the GPS, and off we were for a spring break, camping in some haunted woods. After the first hour and a half on the road, a few red flags began to fly. After the last large town before getting way out in the boondocks, my phone's data signal cut out, and the GPS randomly changed directions on us. Since none of us had any idea where the hell we were at, or where Mossy Glen was supposed to be, we didn't have much choice but to blindly follow the new route. Here's a little something about Iowa land distribution, especially up north, because the hills can get someone even at places you end up with portions of land that are too steep or too rocky to farm, or small flat basins that are surrounded by steep slopes that it makes farming incredibly difficult. Over the course of several decades, you end up with farms buying a plot of farmland with patches of unworkable land stuck in between. Rather than buy this land and pay property tax on it for several centuries, as these farms stay in the family for generations, the land either remains unpurchased and public, repurchased by the state, or donated to the state or DNR. Many of these plots get designated as state parks or preserves surrounded by private property, such as. As soon as we found out Mossy Glen Hollow. This explains the private property signs we saw by the lake which was land purchased right next to the unusable boulder covered creek. This is a bit important for the sake of the story. And now that you understand it, we will dive back in there. Once we're firmly in the middle of nowhere, our GPS took us off the paved highways and onto gravel roads. At this point, you typically would see the usual brown Iowa DNR signs, designating that you were near a state park, but there were none. There weren't even any tree clumps to indicate that you were near some sort of forest. Red flag number two. Another 10 minutes or so into the drive, and the gravel road soon turns into a dirt road, then a low maintenance road, then a class B minimum maintenance road with Iowa's dedication to road preservation. This basically means that somebody probably came by and took a peek in the 90s, and promptly forgot about its existence. As we came around the last hilly bend that the GPS shows on our route, 
we see a farmhouse with a large machine shed, with no lights or activity around either, and no cars in the driveway. A bit weirded out that a house would be right next to a state park, we slow down and keep rolling. To our dismay, however, the road dissolves into a mess of washed tractor tire gouges from last fall's harvest. We stop the cars as far down as we can pass without getting hung up on a frozen rut and unpack some of our equipment. The road gradually narrows, snakes down the middle of a field, and turns down into the small but very thick clump of woods at the bottom of a wide ravine. We get out and hike down the gradually steepening slope and take in the scenery. At first, Everything looks like a pretty damn cool set to film at. There are several lime outcrops hanging off the hillside, a footpath with some picturesque tree overhang, and even a few birds out that made an unseasonal return from wintering down south. We can all hear some water running, but can't identify a source from the trail. Looking off in any direction, all that we see was a seemingly endless sea of trees. At the bottom of the hill was a small pond, in the middle of a grassy clearing with a fence. As we approached the fence, we noticed a sign. Private property. Keep out. Bill checks his watch and realises it's almost time for dinner. So we trek back to our vehicles and hook up the GPS. The nearest town over, was a little place called Edgewood that had several diners and a gas station to load up on supplies for the week. We brought some canned food, but not much beyond that. As we got to town, we realised that Edgewood was a lot smaller than we had expected. Less than 900 people, it would turn out. Everyone knows everyone in these small towns, so we got several weird looks when four strangers rolled up with plates from the other side of the state. Kyle thought to ask the cashier and a few people at the gas station about Mossy Glen Hollow, and why the only route in was through some dude's field on a busted out dirt road. To our surprise, nobody had even heard of a place called Mossy Glen, nor could they figure out why the hell four high schoolers suddenly rolled into town looking for the place. Red flag number three. We shrug it off as just a few crazy locals and take off back down the dirt trail. As we round the corner back near the farmhouse, we notice all the lights are off and nobody seems to be home. I suggest that we leave some sort of note on the house door that we're going to be parking on the side of the road near their place just to be safe. It's starting to get late in the day, and being this far out in the country, it wouldn't be unheard of to come face to face with a shotgun when the homeowner finds our cars, since the road is impassable from that point onwards. Parking there wouldn't realistically block anyone off the road and would still technically be on public land. We hike back down the wooded trail and start scouting for a place to set up camp for the night, making sure to be on the public side of the fenced pond area. We discover that the sea of trees that we saw earlier was actually quite a bit thinner when seen from below. In fact, the dirt path led to a decently sized clearing with a creek and small waterfall cutting through the limestone deposits. None of us could believe that we had missed such a thing a few hours earlier. When Bill comes to a realisation, he disappears around the corner, back into the trees, and emerges at the top of the trail a few minutes later. Though we could plainly see him, the trees lined up just right, so that he could not see anything beyond the rocks below the path ledge. Continuing further up the creek, we notice that there are conveniently placed rocks, about the perfect distance apart to step without disturbing the water or surrounding rocks. One could walk almost silently up and down the creek, while the sound of the water masked the steps. 
Not thinking much of it, we take some pictures of the large moss covered boulders and get some pretty nice scenic shots. We find a place to make camp and everything is going great until we approach the waterfall. Just before the waterfall sat a clearing without any large boulders or rocks and an odd arrangement of logs. One sat horizontal, supported at each end by two piles of rocks. In front sat a crude stone circle with a pile of burnt logs inside. A fire pit with a bench. Though a bit of a surprise at first, we shrug it off as some weekend project that the people up at the house put together. After all, with such a cool place just a short walk from home, why not? I have a similar fire pit set up at home, so I'm not totally concerned. Hey, what the hell is this? Kyle yells it from a boulder a few yards ahead. On it sat a blaze orange beanie, a single gardening glove, and an empty can of beer. Oh, and a stick of deodorant that had seen some serious wear. Looking closer at the beer can, we realized that it must have been opened fairly recently. Foam is still fresh in the bottom of the can, and it had a fumy smell. Bewildered by what the hell we just found, Jake starts looking around the other side of the boulders upstream of the items. Holy shit, there's a cave! He shouts back to us. Later, he told us the cave was large enough to comfortably fit a person inside, and that, more disturbingly, he saw some red fabric inside as well. Before he can get a good look around, Kyle calls the three of us back over with a sense of urgency. He speaks very quietly to us and indicates that we shouldn't shout back. Shampoo, he whispers, pointing urgently down at his feet. Sure enough, in the mud and leaves, there's a blue bottle of suave shampoo right next to the creek. At this point, we're all adequately freaked out and ready to call our little soiree quits. Bill remains pretty sure that this is just junk left behind by the people at the house after a weekend and a few too many bush lights. But things don't just add up to me. There's one detail that I've been leaving out at this point. The day before, this part of Iowa got some heavy rain, which contributed to the mud situation on the dirt road and on the trail. With the combination of wind and rain, the items on the rocks would have shown some signs of being wet, if not, then displaced entirely. Also, the air was pretty cold, as it is every year around this time, not getting above the mid 40s for the whole week. Then everything starts to click for me. Whoever drank the beer and left the shampoo, hat, glove, deodorant, must have done this sometime this morning. The fire pit also had fresh char marks on the rocks, and the wood had not been wet for a while, meaning it must have been lit last night at the earliest. The small cave would have provided enough shelter from the rain to stay dry, without the freezing temperatures or through the day. Whoever was using shampoo out here must have had little other choice to do so. If it was the homeowners, they would have had to be seriously masochistic to bathe in the shallow freezing rocky creek rather than at home. If it wasn't, then we likely weren't alone right now. Whoever left these things out left in a hurry. And if they were here four hours ago, they would have been able to see us on the trail cliff long before we even knew they were down here. Remembering the arrangements of rocks on the stream, they could have even been leaving their camp just as we were coming down the dirt trail. As I processed this, I started to look around at my surroundings and realized that the small area was bordered by the thick trees on the trail side. Several sets of huge boulders on the pond side and limestone cliffs everywhere else. Due to the tree, rock and hill cover, you could light a fire in the pit at night, 
and no one around you would even know. The illusion of being able to see up the dirt trail from the camp, but not down, played in reverse from the cliffs. If you were wearing brown or green, you could easily see down from the rocks on top of the camp below, while blending in with the trees above. Coming to these realizations, I noticed something else, something more sinister. The birds and small animals that were previously heard are now quiet, aside from the soft babble of the creek. The entire place is completely silent. As I start to explain this to the rest of the group, I see the wheels turning in their heads as well. Jake starts to head back to the small cave, when a rustling up on the limestone ridge catches our attention. Something large was shifting around up there, something that apparently didn't want Jake to see what was in the cave. We all look up at whatever or whoever made the noise as it started shuffling down the ridge towards the makeshift camp. Because of the high cliff, the only way down to us would be going all the way back down to the pond and then double back up the stream. Realizing this and almost crapping ourselves at how open we were, we book it back down the stream, up the dirt path across the field, and back to our cars. On the drive back to Edgewood, we all try and process what the hell just happened. I take a look at a satellite map, and the only really accessible way to the cliff where we heard the noise would be to walk up there from the pond. It was too craggy to approach from the adjacent field to the east. Whatever made that noise would have been large, and a deer getting up there wouldn't necessarily be out of the question, but I doubt it. It would have had to have been some incredible timing to have started moving around just as Jake began looking at the cave, and whatever red fabric was inside. Kyle found a report of an escaped convict from a local prison a few weeks ago, and was convinced that it was his camp that we found, though we were all doubtful at best of this idea. To satisfy his concerns, we'd agreed to report the strange thing we found to the police, anonymously, since we all really wanted to get home at this point. None of us followed up with them, and I doubt anything came of it. A small, close-knit town police department gets a report of strange sightings for some stranger the same day that four high schoolers roll up and park outside a farmer's house for a few hours and then book it out doesn't exactly spell high-threat criminal activity to me. Still, things still just don't seem to add up. Whoever came running down that cliff, if indeed it was a who, wanted to keep whatever was inside that cave hidden, but not enough to actually fight four decently tall and able teenagers. We figured he just wanted to scare us off, since the noises seemed to stop once we reached the dirt path. I thought it odd that someone living out in the woods with something seemingly to hide would set up shop in a state park. That is, until I checked my GPS again. That little reroute that it took us on was an old entrance to the park that had been cut off by the purchase of the lake area, sometime between the map records used for Google's navigation being updated and that day. The current entrance to the park is about two miles north of where the GPS sent us, thinking it was a faster route. The place we were at was still public land for sure, but not quite what we pictured. So dude in Mossy Glen Hollow, let's not meet again. In the year 2000, when I was 10 years old, my parents sent me to a five-day summer camp in Huntsville, Ontario. This camp was definitely a Bible camp, and being raised without religion, I felt uncomfortable there. But I got along well with my peers. Me and seven other girls were staying in the room on the far right, and there were three other rooms on the main floor, and upstairs is where the camp counsellors bunked. 
The main floor had a very high ceiling, and near the top was a small square door, which attached to where the camp counsellors were staying. I was staying along the right wall on the bottom bunk. On the third night, me and my bunkmate were having a blast, just talking and telling jokes. But our camp counsellor opened the little door at the top of the room and told us to be quiet. So we all went to bed. Out of nowhere, I hear Brianna yelling, Cat, wake up, wake up now. And being the light sleeper I was, I immediately woke up. I didn't know how long I had slept for. I then heard Angel say, Cat, look over to the bunk in front of you. I was facing the wall. So I turn around and I met with a black figure with long curly hair sitting on the ladder leading up to the top bunk on the bed in front of mine. The moonlight illuminated the entire room, and this figure was completely opaque, shaking her long curly hair. I looked around the room and noticed all of the girls were all accounted for and definitely awake. I stared at this thing for what seemed like an eternity. Every one of the girls were in complete hysterics and crying. But I was dead silent. I couldn't make a peep. I was completely terrified to the point I couldn't blink or even move. I mean, what could I have done? This thing was sitting there right before my eyes. Then this figure stands up and jumps off the ladder and just stood at the edge of the bed for a moment. All of the girls scream, Cat, get out of there now! To which the figure moved around in an almost robotic way and started walking towards me. I finally then find the nerve to book it out of the bottom bunk and run to the other side of the room. I run up to Brianna and Angel's bunk and climb the ladder as quickly as I could. At this point, I started becoming hysterical and crying like the rest of them. The figure was still standing near my bed. Angel and I started hugging and I was too afraid to even open my eyes after what I'd seen. Angel decides to jump down off the bunk, switch the light on, and just like that, the figure was gone. I guess we made a lot of noise, and the camp counsellor opened the little door and told us to keep it down. We told her what we'd seen, and she came downstairs to investigate. She came into the room and told us, There's nothing here. Your mind was probably playing tricks on you. Now back to bed. All of the girls, including myself, were still pretty upset and scared, and just sat up in our bunks talking about what we'd seen. Five minutes after, we hear screaming coming from the room directly across the hall from us. We all started crying again, and the camp counsellors opened the little door and told us, See what you've started? You have everyone in the cabin scared. The camp counsellor went to investigate, and we turned on the lights in our room and opened the door. We hear one of the girls in the room across from us say while crying, Something lifted our bunk. Please don't make us stay in there. It's going to kill us. To which the counsellor sternly responded with, That's impossible. Now quiet down and go to bed. This is the final time I'll say this. After 20 minutes of talking quietly, we all went to bed. Nothing else strange happened during the duration of the camp trip, and I had exchanged phone numbers with the girls. About a week after the camp trip had ended, I contacted both Angel and Brianna, and asked them if they remembered that night, and they both said they did, and they said they'd never forget it. This was the very first experience I had with the paranormal. After the Bible camp incident, I had no more paranormal events. Until I was 14, that is. When these occurrences started, I would mostly just hear strange stuff, like someone scratching the walls outside my bedroom, screaming and growling and footsteps, and sometimes what sounded like footsteps with long toenails dragging along the floor very creepy laughs that sounded like it came from someone with an incredibly deep voice, and occasionally, 
something whispering my name into my ear. These noises used to be confined to outside my bedroom, but after a while, they'd always lead into my room. Very rarely would I ever see anything. It was mostly just audio. When I did see something, it was mainly a tall black hooded figure, either standing in my doorway or the foot of my bed. Sometimes I would feel something trying to grab my foot, or something running its fingers through my hair, which caused me to always keep the end of my blanket tucked under my feet for years. These occurrences would generally last all night until sunrise, but its peak hours were between 1 and 4am. Sometimes things would occur even during the day. At age 14 one night, I was awoken by shuffling, a noise coming from my dresser area. I'm a light sleeper. Any noise will wake me. And when I looked at my dresser, I saw a very tall hooded man, pitch black, going through my panty drawer. Even though I was completely terrified, I got the nerve to sit up in bed. The figure then turned completely around and acknowledged me in the room, by staring at me for a few seconds before vanishing. For some reason, I had no idea why, but I fell asleep after that with no problem at all. When I awoke in the morning, one of my pairs of bras were missing, as well as some of my underwear on the floor. Fast forward a few weeks, I was downstairs in the basement doing laundry, and saw something hanging from a rusty nail on a support beam. And sure enough, it had been the bra that was missing. My mum's best friend Denise was over a few days ago to go blueberry picking with my mother during the summer. Denise brought with her about 20 packages of cosmetic removal wipes, which we put on the top of the towel cupboard outside the bathroom door. My mum decided she'd go grocery shopping with my dad to get food for supper, which left Denise and I in the house alone. Knowing that Denise was also sensitive to the paranormal, I began telling her about what had been happening in the house and what I had experienced. We decided to get up off the couch and walk towards my kitchen. And then we see our locked front door unlock itself and open without any force. Wide eyed, we both look at each other. Did you see that? She said. I then walked to lock the front door. This incident got Denise pretty shaken up, and later on in the night I was lying in bed and started to hear a crinkly sound. The crinkly noise continued for a few minutes, and it dawned on me that it was someone playing with the packages of makeup removal wipes on the top of the cupboard. All of a sudden, they all fall down onto the floor. My mum opens her bedroom door and goes to pick them up because she heard them fall too. It got eerily quiet for about 20 minutes, and then the crinkly sounds start again. All the wipes fell down, and not five seconds later, my bed was pushed into the wall really hard with me on it, causing me to scream bloody murder. My mother came running out of her room asking me what was wrong. I was crying and told her what happened, and she told me it was nonsense. I got out of bed, turned on the light, and pushed my bed away from the wall, when I noticed the wall was indented on the right side where the impact hit. I never push my bed right up against the wall. I always have my bed at least an inch away from the wall, because my power outlet is on the left side of my bed. I swear, these are all true. Back in primary school, third grade, we had this third grade camp on our school's rugby field on a Friday night. No tents though. We all slept in the clubhouse on the field. It was a lit night. We played games, hide and seek, sang songs, and teased the third grade couples. It was an amazing night, till my group of friends and I went out to hide on the other side of the rugby field with all the lights turned off. We had three flashlights, and being third graders, we were all already in this spooky, scary vibe. 
We were planning to go hide in the tree, where we spent our breaks during school, but quickly decided otherwise when we saw two men. Well, they may have been teenagers, but we were short, and it was quite dark. And ran back to our clubhouse and told the three class teachers who were spending the night with us. All us children were called inside the clubhouse for safety and supervision. The male teacher that was with us took a flashlight and went to check if they really were the two guys there. And if they were, how? As they must have broken into school, because the only way to get to the field was through the school. We were supposed to close the blinds in order not to see. But I was too curious, so kept peeking under the blind closest to me. To this day, I remember the teacher walking 40 meters until he was behind a tree. From my angle, I could see him. He was just standing there for two minutes, then came back and told the other teachers he saw nothing, but that they should call the police just in case. He was too damn scared to check it out himself. Well, I feel you, bro. Anyway, later that night, two cops arrived, and a few minutes later, two more vans pulled up. We were sent home. Some of the parents weren't happy to come and fetch us at 10pm, and the children who didn't have lifts had to go sleep at the teacher's houses. We were never told what the cops found that night. So I did some digging, many years later, as I'm 16 now. The creepy thing was, the Monday that we went to school again, my group and I went to the tree where we saw two men. The tree had lots of cuts in it, clearly by some knife. There were also numbers written all over the tree. But the sight of a big body sized hole covered up with sand made my group and I decide not to sit there anymore. What I found out was that this mentally ill person was coerced to bury a body there that night. We were incredibly close to it when we were playing hide and seek. And I'm so glad we didn't venture any further, as our fates might have been the same as the poor soul who was being put in the ground of our school. I was 13, and in a wilderness treatment program for behavioral stuff. The place was out in the mountains of southern Utah, by a place called Joe's Camp. Plenty of weird stuff happened out there, and I have a few stories, but this freaked me out the most, and the physical feeling I got, I can still conjure up today. One night, we were sitting around the fire telling scary stories, and the topic of Wendigos came up. Some swore up and down that they were real, and one staff member said they were old tales of encounters in the area. We bantered about it for a few minutes. And then, being the edgy teen I was, I blurted out something like, Screw a Wendigo. I'll kill one with my bare hands if it shows itself. And later that night, when I was asleep, I had this dream. I was basically watching this deer in a clearing, and I had the worst feeling ever of doom. And then suddenly this deer is crushed, I mean obliterated, like I really can't describe it. It was kind of sucked up under a big rock, and its spinal cord flew out and impaled me. And I got the feeling when I was impaled and it was the worst and weirdest pain I've ever had. The best way to describe it was like a dirty scraping feeling. I was then in the dream looking at my feet out at the end of my top tent, and I was ripped out the tent. I woke up suddenly and was sitting in my sleeping bag outside my tent making the strangest noise I've ever heard. It was like a wheezing screech, a primal death cry. And I looked around quickly crawled back to my tent and wrote it off as a bad dream, and didn't really speak about it while I was there. I don't know how to plausibly explain it, other than a weird dream and sleepwalking, but it definitely jarred me, and when I remember it, I can't help but feel incredibly uneasy.
I was leading a backpacking trip for a Girl Scout camp. There were two other adults, the counselor in the kids group, who were supposed to care for the kids, as I taught wilderness skills. Our first day out, we arrived and chose where to camp. I told the kids and staff to set up their tents. I set mine up quickly, and then told the other two adults that I was going off to poop. I walked a ways away from the kids, dug my hole, and was doing my business, when gunshots fired. I wasn't finished though, so although I knew the kids would be spooked, I trusted the counselors were doing their job and taking care of them. I finished, left no trace, and hiked back to the camp where the kids set up. I arrived about five minutes after the gunshots. There was pandemonium. The girls were panicking. One had apparently taken the lead and suggested that everyone change into camouflage colors. A few had changed, the others asked me what to do. What I couldn't understand was where the hell the other staff were. I calmed the kids, explained to them that there were often hunters in the area, and that they weren't madmen out to get them. I told them that if they really wanted to change, bright clothing was actually best, but they were fine. I then asked where the other adults were. They just shrugged. I found the other two counselors in their tent, which they had pitched far from the kids. They were relaxing, reading magazines they'd apparently packed for entertainment, and giving each other quizzes. I was frankly shocked and appalled. I lost my temper and yelled and asked them why they hadn't gone and checked on the kids when they heard gunshots. They shrugged. We assumed you were taking care of it. But I told you I was leaving to crap in the woods. You two were responsible for the kids when I was gone. We thought you'd come back. We're taking a break. So I dealt with the kids, counselors included. I met the hunters while refilling water and let them know to avoid hunting in the area where we're camping. When we got back to camp, my supervisor got a full report and those two staff members were never given a backpacking group again or placed together. The kids luckily had a good time on the rest of the trip. About 20 years ago, a friend and I were hiking on the AT in Northern Georgia. We camped at a place called Indian Graveyard. There were no graves there, just the stumps of fallen trees that had died due to an infestation. But it looked like a graveyard. It was early spring, and the weather was kind of sketchy. That night, as we were going to sleep in the tents, the wind was blowing pretty hard. Suddenly it stopped, like a switch had been thrown. We sat up, concerned that something bad was about to happen weather-wise. As we sat there listening, we heard footsteps outside the tent. They moved slowly around the tent from the right, behind on the left, then stopped at the front. We were terrified. Without warning, my friend Donny shouted at the top of his lungs, You better get the hell out of here. I have a gun, and I'll blow your damn head off. Well, he didn't have a gun, and he scared the crap out of me for screaming like that. He told me later he thought the footsteps might have been a drunk redneck messing with us, or someone trying to get up to no good. Right after he screamed, a huge round light flared on. It was about 10 feet off the ground, about 10 feet in diameter, a perfect circle of blinding light so bright we could see it through the orange tent material. Silently, it floated there without moving for what seemed like hours, and with no warning the light went out, and when it did, at the exact same time, the wind started blowing again. With only one flashlight, Donnie and I abandoned our camp and ran nearly a mile to where our car was parked. We got in and drove to Helen, a little mountain town about eight miles away. We parked in a parking lot and stayed in the car until morning. Right after sunrise, we went back to our camp. Nothing was missing, but we did find the ground disturbed around the tent by holes in the ground, about an inch in diameter each evenly spaced around the tent. Each hole was about six inches deep. 
We grabbed all of our stuff and went home. To this day, I haven't been back to Indian graveyard and doubt I ever will. This happened two days ago in Southwest Sweden. It was around 5pm in the afternoon. And I decided to meet up with one of my friends. We both have mopeds, scooters, and drove to the grocery store to get a snack for our small trip. After that, we headed towards a beautiful sheep pasture that I had been to once and wanted to visit again. It was maybe 15 minutes away from the center of our town. After a while I came to a narrow road surrounded by a forest. Since it rarely drives any kind of vehicle out there, I started to drive on the middle of the road, and sometimes even the part of the road meant for the approaching cars. At one moment I looked in my rearview mirror, and saw my friend driving close to the edge of the road. At first I thought she was trying to make a point that I should keep to my part of the road. But then she drove even closer to the edge and almost fell into a ditch. I stopped and waited until she caught up with me. We were both laughing and I asked her what happened. She said she was distracted by something weird on a tree besides the road and forgot to turn. We laughed and kept on going. Later on, we sat in the sheep pasture eating our snacks. We started talking about it again for some reason. And I asked her what she saw. And what she described was some kind of wood plank nailed to a tree and that it looked like a figure, a person with just holes as eyes. My reaction was, what the hell that's disturbing. And she responded with, yeah, kind of creepy. We decided to try and locate it again on our way home. We stopped by the road, and I turned off the engine. When I looked up, I spotted it right away. And it gave me the creeps. It was hanging there in a tree looking all dead. And I decided to take a picture of it when we drove home. When I saw it, my thoughts went straight to cults and murderers that put up some kind of sign to show where they've been, or a hint that they're about to make a move. I don't think I'll go there again. And I'm not sure what it could be. But it just didn't feel right. About five years ago, me and a group of friends drunkenly decided to go camping. It was a decision made while being drunk. But when we sobered up next morning, we all thought it would be something really fun to do. We were on summer break. So we got together our gear and headed off in two different vehicles. Once we arrived to the state park, we all unloaded everything and started making our way through to try and find a decent clearing not too far so that we could drink our beers and carry on our little partying in peace. We walked for what felt like hours. I had to carry a whole load of cans in my backpack. And the further we got, the more complaining our group became, as we knew that it would take even longer to get more beers when we inevitably ran out. The guy who was leading us was called Chet. And as we kept going through, he insisted he knew the area and that there was a fantastic clearing just a little further up. This phrase a little further up, I still have trouble listening to today, as it really gets on my nerves, for he didn't stop saying it. And after walking for literally three hours, did we all say we were turning back. However, fortunately for Chet, five minutes later, we found a small but decent clearing, obviously not the one that he told us about. But we settled there as we were tired and started drinking. At some point during the drinking session, Chet went off to pee and didn't come back for a while. We just assumed that his pee had turned to a poop and waited up. About 40 minutes had passed. It was taking obscenely long. How far did he go? 
We decided at this point it would be best if a few of us went out to look for him. Of course, there's no cell phone signal this far into the wilderness. And we left with flashlights and began to look around. It didn't take long for the people who left to come back, saying that he wasn't within the immediate area. And we started to get worried. Some of us talked about calling the cops, but Chet was a responsible adult. And we thought that maybe he was just annoyed trying to find the alternate campsite. Some of us convinced ourselves this was the case, but not me. I knew Chet quite well and didn't think that he'd go along without us. He wasn't that buzzed yet. I was mentally debating with myself whether or not I should go get the cops and decided that as it was quite late at night, and I wasn't sure if I could make my way back, that I'd wait for the morning and then see. Morning comes. Chet's tent remained unoccupied. At this point, we start getting very nervous. We shout, start calling out, and have no idea where he's at. I tell my friends that I'm going back to call the cops. I make the trek, running, panting, in record time for fear of my friend. When the cops get my message, they say that they'll look into it. To cut a long story short, we looked together with the people sent and couldn't find him. It was a horrifying ordeal. This was a number of years ago, and none of us know what happened to Chet. No body, no animals nearby that could have harmed him, as far as we're aware anyway, and no sudden drops in the area. Me and my friends have gone back with the solemn purpose to see if we can find any traces of our friend, but he vanished off the face of the earth. Wherever you are, Chet, I hope you rest in peace. This is a story I heard from my dad on three separate occasions. He is a hardened Navy SEAL, has done it all, traveled the world, and is generally someone who is known not to be messed with. He has always been very strict, but also never lies. Which is why on the few times he told me this story, it creeped me out a lot more. He isn't one to believe in the paranormal. But this I think is his exception to the rule, as he swears up and down it's true. Anyway, a number of years ago, at least 40, when he was in his early teens, his grandparents had a big forest behind their house, many acres. And he would sometimes pitch a tent for fun and spend a night in the forest and come back in the morning for breakfast. And one of these nights, he made his way out, put up his tent and tried relaxing, listening to the sound of nature. He fell asleep very quickly, but woke up in the dead of night. There was some strange rustling going on outside the tent. He, as you can expect, being the hard nut kid he was, assumed it was an animal or a person, most likely a family member, and without trepidation, unzipped and came out. That's when he was confronted with a creature the likes of which he'd never seen. It was like a dog but fully bipedal, standing there. It wasn't even staring at him. It was at least 50 feet away, staring up at the pale moonlight. It had strong facial features, exaggeratedly strong muscles, and looked like it could tear apart a car. He stood there in stunned silence, the creature, as he thought, completely unaware of him. My father thought it would be unwise to make his presence known, and as quietly as he could, began backing away into the tent. He sat down in the tent, stared at the creature still, while trying to do it up again. That's when 
the creature turned and cocked its head straight towards my dad. They locked eyes for a second, and not a moment passed, the creature bolted away. It ran at a speed the likes of which my father did not expect. He even stood up to see where it went, but it was gone. Safe to say, my father just ran straight home, and he didn't go camping again for many, many years until we were small children. I think he needed about a 20 year break before he felt confident again that whatever it was that he saw that night wouldn't come looking for him once more. A few years ago, I wanted to take my girlfriend out on a camping trip to get at one with nature. Two days in and we were having a great time. We did some exploring, found a really pretty waterfall that we thought we could have been the first to see in ages, and generally spent our time relaxing and reading, which is what we both enjoyed doing. However, part of the reason I decided to camp in this specific place was because I wanted somewhere isolating. I wanted it to be just the two of us. In the middle of the night, I awoke. I heard a weird sound, like a knock on a tree. I twist around and my girlfriend is lightly snoring in her sleeping bag. I rub my eyes and listen. There's a tapping. It's carrying on. And then, a sound. It took me a while to identify it, but it was definitely scratching on the tent. Very light. That very distinctive sound, as it goes from top to bottom. I want to call out, but I'm petrified. Someone is outside. And then I hear a whisper. Hello, dearie. It was Brickworthy. I unzip myself after about a minute, didn't hear a noise, and slowly peek my head out seeing if anything is visible. It's a full moon, and it's quite bright. I look around the clearing, and there's no one. The thing is, I didn't hear a sound. Unless whoever said that floated away, I have no idea how they left the area without making a single sound. Hey guys, it's Mort here, and thank you so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed tonight's camp stories. If you did, you know what to do. So as always, a huge thank you to my incredible patrons for your incredible support and generosity. As I've said before, it really does mean an awful lot and it helps me out more than you can imagine. So thanks guys. Thank you for being incredible. If you'd like your name featured at the end of every video, as well as some extra cool prizes, you can find the information in the description, as well as where you can find where to send your stories if you'd like to share one and have it read on the channel, as three subscribers did tonight. With that being said, though, it's time for me to sign off. Stay awesome, and I'll see you in the next one.